So welcome to our Q&A on Thought of the Week. Today we have our amazing leader Desiree in the hot seat. Welcome Desiree and thanks for setting aside the time to face the mob clamouring for answers. Could you please summarise your talk on Sunday for us? So it was a very famous story that's in all the Gospels, the story of the miraculous feeding of the multitude or the crowd. Basically, there's a huge crowd that's followed Jesus into the wilderness. And rather than send them home, he wants to offer them hospitality. And people are wondering how that could happen. And a young boy offers his lunch, five small fish and two barley loaves, it would be like two bread rolls. And somehow, miraculously, everyone has enough to feed and there's an abundance left over. So in a nutshell, uh, that's a story, key, key text and great th theme throughout scripture, um, hospitality. So the theme, the theme is like a golden thread that runs throughout scripture. So I think it begins in Genesis 18, where uh, two people, Abraham and Sarah, they're sitting under an oak tree and they see three strangers walk past, and then they provide a feast. Goes on in Exodus about 16. There's a group of runaway slaves that have left Egypt in oppression, and they're in the wilderness on their way to a promised land. And again, there's nothing to eat, and manna is provided. So the theme continues there. And it happens a few more times through scripture. So it's one of the golden themes. And the questions that we have are regarding generosity and the generosity, particularly of the young boy who contributed, I guess, everything that he had for lunch. And as a congregation, we've been exploring generosity in July. Is it just a chance that that gospel story came up? Was it, it, was in the... it was the lectionary reading for the day. It just, just happened that way. Right. Mm. So, so some churches strongly push the idea, even weekly, that we can't outgive God, and they use that as a challenge to the congregation to tithe and increase their giving. At St. Bart's, we don't follow that approach. What would be right or wrong in adopting that for our congregation? Adopting, adopting give until it hurts or? Something like that, yeah. Okay. No, I don't, I don't uh, agree with, with that. Uh, the scripture always talks about um, operating from the point of view of an abundance. Psalm 23, my cup overflows. Uh, John 10 verse 10, I've come that you might have life in all its fullness. So I think if we can hold the link between generosity and hospitality close together, I think that's what's on offer. So I, I, I do feel it's a little bit manipulative to say that the only way you can give to God is to give to the church. Uh, we give to God by giving to um, the vulnerable and the marginalised. So some of that is the church, yes, but could be the Red Cross, could be World Vision, could be environment. So the church is just one avenue of uh, receiving um, generosity from, from people. I, I think it can lead to institutional greed mm. to push the theme uh, too much, I think. I think that's manipulative and leads to institutional greed. Um, yeah, so it's yeah the the link the link in all of these things is is just the idea of hospitality. So it's usually the release of abundance. So we're not asking for food and water that you need to survive on. We're asking that you give of your abundance. And there's a relief in that. And um, 
it's in the nature of human beings to be generosity and to meet the needs of others, but it only works if it comes from a spirit of wanting to do it. If you do it because you should or you feel you have to or you feel compelled to or you feel pressured to, I don't think the, the energy is, is right. Uh, the young boy in that story made a free offering of his lunch. He didn't he wasn't forced or coerced into it. It just has a different, different feel about it. I'm not sure if that answers the question, actually, but I, th I think it's about hospitality. So you describe several amazing provisions that you have witnessed in your ministry, leaving you in no doubt that although we don't understand how the miracle in the gospel happened, we can be quite sure that it did happen then and it still happens today. <clears throat> uh, there are many instances where supply has met the demand over long periods of time. As a young person, I was quite impressed by the story of George Mueller and his orphanages in England. More recently, I've read the bio of Reverend Bill Clues in Asheville, Sydney and the amazing way in which supply, even to the extent of millions of dollars, has come in for uh, their <coughs> uh, loaves and fishes ministry and the other exodus ministry that they run. Without breaking these experiences, your experiences and the other experiences we've read of, down to a strategy or a formula, what do you think is the essence of the supply in these instances and your own cases? What is behind it? So, so if you step into the, the biblical stories of the, the miracle of feeding the multitude, there's no explanation for how it's given. So there's one view that takes a literalist approach and thinks a miracle did happen. Um, but there's another view that says that when some people started offering their lunch, others were inspired to do the same, and a little shared uh, becomes, becomes an abundance. But when, you, when you're in those situations where you just don't know how it's going to happen, and then you look back and it did happen, you also, I, I just understand the energy, I think, of what's going on in that story because you don't quite know how it happened, uh, but it did happen. So, yeah, so treasurers probably get a bit irritated with me, but I, I remember once we were, I was part of a building project um, in WA and the, the price tag for it was in excess of 700,000. Uh, but as far as I was concerned, that was the least of our worries. The difficult thing is understanding what the vision is and what it is you want to offer. Because I think the resources, the resources uh, follow. So, yeah, within two years we had enough money to build the ministry centre um, and more. But the point is, two years before that, no one really thought it was possible. Uh, you know, two years later, somehow the resources managed to come together. Well, that's interesting because you're putting the vision first and the supply happens after that. Correct. For our own local scene in Alstonville, what, what do you see that there, uh, we're only a small church and we don't have a lot of physical resources, what vision would you see for Alstonville and what small resources would we have to put towards that to start it off? To start it off. Well, well I think you touched on it when you started. I think, I think the, the vision of a, of a healed world uh, comes first. So it's, it's literally just believing that the Lord's Prayer is true, may it be on earth as it is in heaven. So, so heaven is just uh, 
God's best plan for humanity and creation. So, you know, does God's best plan include severe poverty? No, I, I don't think so. So partners with God uh, work towards uh, God's vision by counteracting poverty uh, in, in that way. So in Austinville, I think one of our poverties for me is a, is a lack of diversity. Di diversity gives a very strong energy and we, we, we grow through diversity. So if the diversity doesn't happen naturally, I would look forward to a time where we could maybe sponsor refugees from other countries who could come enrich our lives with their diversity in the hope that we enrich their lives with our diversity. And so I would see it as a, as a partnership in hospitality that way. We do have some resources. We have some buildings and we have people with a huge amount of skill, people with a huge amount of passion, a lot of love to give. So, so I would be reaching beyond Austinville to, to offer what we, we have for a healed universe. So diversity is the word and hospitality, hospitality is yeah. the word. And we, we meld those into a vision, yeah, so which the, is the key thing is that a vision. Yeah, so the, the key thing is that it's the hospitality that transforms. So in hospitality, people are transformed from being a stranger to hopefully being a friend to hopefully eventually being family. So if we ho offer hospitality in our space, in our village, to people beyond Australia who desperately need a safe home, through that hospitality we are transformed and they are transformed. But in receiving our hospitality, they offer a hospitality um, of their own. So yeah, my big dream would be offering something like a community kitchen where all members of society can come and share a meal together, just pay, pay what you want. Um, another dream would be to invite refugee families to, to come and make their home with us, that our community be, would be the ones to sponsor them, uh, learn from them, walk alongside them. Fantastic. Well, I like that vision. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And thanks for, for joining us for this short Q&A yeah. and hopefully we'll keep it going. <laughs>